<laughs> this is perfect because, see, these are my pointers. This is just the perfect height for me. Okay. Um, Do you want to leave the point? No, I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry. That sounded like you. No. Nope. I don't care when we're there. Um, so, uh, 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 understanding the, the origins of community structure is one of our uh, uh, it's an important topic in, uh, in ecology and uh, certainly kind of a central theme for community ecology. And uh, documenting patterns in community structure is really a fairly straightforward thing to do. Uh, but understanding the origins of dynamics in space and time uh, is a lot more tricky. Um, and uh, there are a number of problems uh, or reasons that make that hard. And uh, this is a figure from a classic paper of Amir Tower, 1992. Uh, that I don't really want to spend too much time on, but I put it there to kind of as a little uh, point to remind me. Uh, this just shows this shows uh, four different uh, patterns of biomass accumulation along an environmental gradient for for different trophic levels. Like here's a, a primary <laughs> producer biomass as you increase resources, herbivore biomass, uh, consumer, uh, and so forth. And basically, uh, over the years, different uh, ecologists have proposed different patterns you might to expect to see, depending on the, the importance of top-down uh, consumptive effects and bottom-up uh, uh, resource effects. The problem with that is that if you look too hard at this, which I don't recommend, uh, <laughs> you'll see that these patterns in changing biomass across trophic levels overlap a lot from one model to the next. And so just looking at patterns of biomass alone uh, is sort of problematic in, for, in terms of interpreting the, the origins of the dynamics. Um, other problems people have identified uh, the, for interpreting these kinds of data is uh, first, if you have omnivory, uh, also if you have multiple environmental gradients that are simultaneously affecting the things you're looking at, and just in general, sampling efficiently across different tacks of uh, can create biases and problems. Oops, that's not me. So um, this is why community ecologists really prefer to study these kinds of questions experimentally. And uh, uh, experimental manipulations are, and experimental studies are really great. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, we've done a lot of these in my lab. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about a couple of studies um, and results we have to basically uh, use them to generate hypotheses that we're going to then evaluate with, uh, with field data and sampling data that we have. Uh, collected over a number of years. Uh, but I want to point out right this minute that as great as an experimental study is and powerful as they are, there are actually some limitations. And one is that uh, there are a lot of trouble to do. And so you generally are going to be limited in terms of the spatial scale that you can do an experiment uh, and also uh, the temporal rep uh, uh, replication that you can do it. So if you wanted to ask about the importance of of uh, top-down effects in, in, in shaping the abundance of uh, meso consumers in the Everglades. Well, the Everglades is a big place, uh, and you might do that with some kind of uh, manipulation, like excluding uh, uh, consumers, something of that nature. Uh, but what would happen is your results are going to be about a particular space where you do that study. And your question is, you have to ask, can I extrapolate that to a larger scale to the Everglades? Furthermore, the Everglades, you know, is, a, is, is really a great place to study ecology because it's so dynamic and, and therefore it presents a lot of opportunities. But we have the marked seasonality within a year and we have very different years from one to the next. And so you always have to ask yourself about if I do this study at a particular point in the year or in a particular kind of year, how robust again is that, that result? So, so uh, this leads me to want to ask this question uh, of our work from the Everglades, our experimental studies. Do the results scale up? And this is a broader question in community ecology. Uh, can we do these experiments at the scale of, a, of an aquarium, of a, a tank, uh, even a field scale manipulation? Can we do that and then, and then uh, extrapolate those results to the, the scale at which nature actually functions? Um, this is a graph from a figure that uh, uh, I did with uh, um, Evelyn and Nate Dorn, one of my former postdocs, where we put out field cages that look like this in a couple of places out in the, in the glades, uh, in a wet and a dry season in, in a particular year. Uh, and the cages have mesh on them that are different sizes. 
And so they basically uh, exclude, well, well, some of the cages are open on one side and they let large fish and small alligators, we learned, and things like that get into them. Other cages had a mesh on them that excluded larger fish and, and alligators and things like that, but allowed small fish and uh, invertebrates to move in and out freely. And uh, when you do that, you find that, uh, uh, here's the control, so that's an open cage. You find that, they, that you often get a lot more of these small consumers like uh, little, like small fish piling into these cages. Uh, presumably, they're treating it as a refuge from predation. And if you look at the, um, at the algae, uh, well, listen, if you look at this case, on the macroinvertebrates like midge larvae and amphipods and things like that, in these cages, um, uh, in the, 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 these invertebrates that live in the paraphyte mats, you see that their abundance decreases when you have more of these consumers. So that's, that's a type of result that would be consistent with a top-down or a consumptive effect. Um, we've, this experiment, the one I just showed you, actually was done after this experiment. I've, I've actually used that experimental design about nine times now. And so this is from a paper with uh, uh, John Chick and Pam Geddes, a couple of a postdoc and a uh, former student of mine. And we uh, did the same kind of experiment in other places of the Everglades and other seasons. And we found that if you exclude large fish, there is a significant um, negative top-down effect on small fish and macroinvertebrates, a similar result to the last experiment. Um, and uh, so it's a negative effect, and it was both in the wet and the dry season. Uh, and what that means is if you exclude these fish, you get more of these. Uh, and then furthermore, in this case, we looked at uh, algae uh, measures of, of chlorophyll A, biomass, uh, uh, metrics like that. And uh, we found that, um, that um, algae that grows on, uh, on surfaces, which tend to be uh, more dominated by diatom than green algae, edible species, you actually get uh, uh, less of those in these cages where all these consumers are present um, both years. But on the other hand, the actual paraphyte mat itself, like you see on the Everglades, we don't see any grazer effect. Uh, this is a uh, result is, is uh, interesting, and we've done other work about you know how can how to interpret these effects of consumers on the paraphyte mat themselves, trying to get into another trophic level. Uh, these are results. This is just one set of results in, uh, from a number in a paper that Pam Geddes did uh, uh, from another using again cages like this. In this case, they were inclusion cages. Jen helped with this one. She was, I think, an undergraduate. <laughs> So this is getting to be this is a while. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so this results. So I'm kind of summarizing a lot of different. <laughs> that's why the data are so good. Uh, that the uh, uh, I'm summarizing experiments that we've done over a number of years uh, that I think are relevant because uh, uh, to to really the new data I want to talk about. But at any rate, so this this graph is just one figure that illustrates some results that we found really surprising, and that was the more um, uh, Omnivores, so grass shrimp and mosquito fish, which we know include some algae in their diet. Uh, and in fact, we know that it depends on if, if algae is really available, they'll, um, they'll eat a lot of it because we did some experiments that are reported in the study to show it. But oddly enough, the more of these potential consumers that we stocked in the cages, we actually got more wet mass and more chlorophyll A out of the cage at the end. So they're supposed to be eating it, but the cages seem to seem to be producing it. And so there's a number of studies we did. We actually ran this study three different times, and we used different kinds of treatments and things. Uh, Pam did a really great job. But uh, of what I want to say is that these studies support an idea that there are uh, actually um, uh, nutritive, nutrient regeneration effects in the Everglades. The consumers actually get into the paraffin mats, and they, they by, by their actions, their physical actions on the paraffin mat, the consumption and excretion that they do, various things, they actually can regenerate nutrients and the effects of consumers are not necessarily just consumptive, but they can actually be more complex than that. And, um, and then uh, finally, uh, this is from a paper from 2001 from Ryan Taylor and Bill Loftus published this with me. Um, in this study, we wanted to ask about uh, could we document size structure interactions? Uh, in uh, a, a kind of little experimental community of three species of fish that are very common in the Everglades. And so in our mesocosm tanks, we stocked different densities of adult uh, sailfin mollies, which are herbivorous fish, bluefin killifish that eat macroinvertebrate meat, um, like uh, uh, zooplankton and small invertebrates, and then mosquito fish that eat uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, then we had different densities of juvenile sailfin mollies and mosquito fish in these tanks. And so this is like a conceptual model that just shows all the different kinds of biological interactions that, that uh, uh, over a series of five different experiments that, that Ryan <coughs> evaluated, including intraspecific competition of juvenile self in mollies and mosquito fish, uh, as well as interspecific interactions and these adult juvenile type interactions. Um, this graph then, th or this little figure, is the, the, the same <coughs> conceptual model, but the arrows indicate the, the effects that were actually uh, significant. And these experiments were done by stocking these tanks and setting them up to match densities that we actually see in the field as closely as possible, parafide mats in abundance that we see in the field, and to the extent as possible in a mesocosm tank. We tried to match that. And so what he found was that there were actually pretty strong uh, uh, interactions, or what I call, what we call size structure interactions, between the adult fish and the juveniles. Uh, and first, mosquito fish uh, will consume the juveniles if you give them a chance. If you add structure in there, you can kind of diminish that, but they do uh, uh, directly consume them. There's also some evidence of, of intraspecific competition or resource limitation on mosquito fish juveniles. And actually, uh, bluefin killifish adults actually positively benefited. We got faster growth in juveniles when they were present than when they were absent. Uh, and there are various ways that that could happen. Um, Sailfin mollies, on the other hand, actually seem to compete with juveniles. They're all herbivores. Um, basically, this study supports the idea that there are, uh, uh, that if we're thinking about understanding community dynamics in an Everglades aquatic food web, we should um, <coughs> think of it in a size structured way, or we should treat juveniles and adults as separate uh, uh, categories in the way that they interact. At least this uh, in a mesocotton experiment it suggests that. Um, and in fact, uh, in this study, I'm going to throw this in. Uh, Ryan actually did a, like a little aquarium study and showed that these uh, mosquito fish—they're just little fish like this big—but they actually are gape limited. And so, uh, if you look at the size of uh, females of mosquito fish uh, or male mosquito fish, uh, and and you look at the the, 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 the smallest or part of the largest juvenile uh, of their own species or of, of uh, sailfin mollies, you can see that there's sort of a maximum uh, size they can eat and the size increases with, as, as these fish get bigger. Um, and they're slightly different. Uh, but sailfin mollies are broader across the back and they actually, their maximum size they can eat is a little, for the same size mosquito fish is actually a little bit smaller. So there's sort of, sort of interesting effects, but these types of, these are, this is to kind of go to the point that there are mechanisms that we could pinpoint, we have some evidence for for how these size structure interactions might play out uh, in our ecosystem. So um, what I'm interested in today is to talk about how we can take, uh, treat these experimental studies as hypotheses uh, and ask uh, from field data, do we see evidence uh, of these as affecting patterns that we get from field sample? Um, and so I wanna talk about that first by giving you just a very simplified uh, diagram of, uh, of a, an, you know, what I call an interaction web. Now you're probably familiar with, a, with like a food web, which strictly speaking would just document who eats who. Um, an interaction web would also incorporate those kinds of what I call trophic interactions or what people in literature call that, but also biotic interactions. So the effects of one species on another that might not be due to consumption. And so here we have a kind of a, a cartoon uh, that actually uh, Nate Dorn put in a paper a while ago. Uh, um, for the Everglades, where we have our basal resources like uh, paraphyton, algae and paraphyton, uh, flocculent and, and flocculent matter, bacteria, detritus, and so forth, that are feed, that are feeding these primary consumers like small invertebrates uh, that primarily live in the paraphyton, and, and they're also present in the benthos. Uh, biomass tends to be higher than paraphyton, uh, and then intermediate consumers, uh, the smaller fish uh, and uh, crayfish, grass shrimp. And then things that are less than eight centimeters is a break we use in my lab. And then larger predatory fish uh, and, and herpetofauna that might consume them. And so this is just to indicate uh, uh, what you know, is called a trophic cascade. In case you've just forgotten what that means, I'll just point out the idea here is that large predators may eat these intermediate consumers in a simple trophic effect. But they might actually have an, an indirect effect on primary consumers because if they diminish the abundance of these guys, they actually benefit the primary consumers because there's less mortality from that intermediate trophic level. And so they have an indirect effect, the large predators might, uh, could, on the primary consumers by diminishing 
the things that eat them. And we saw some evidence for that in our cage studies, um, but do we actually, does this actually function in this way? In natural food webs, of course, there's a lot of potential for omnivory and other kinds of complexities that might uh, uh, wash out these kinds of effects. They may not scale up. Um, before I get into the, the study, though, and, 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 uh, and our test of, the, of some hypotheses related to food webs, um, I want to mention a, 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 um, an analytical issue for understanding this type of ecology. Um, and so what we're really talking about here is a network of interactions. And I would pose to you that in biology in general, and certainly in ecology, the interactions and the things we're interested in often actually are best described as a network. Because, you know, while we're interested in these consumptive, in the direct consumptive effects, A, eats B, B, and C, you can show that with things like gut contents, and if, it, if something is in the stomach of something else, uh, it probably ate it. <laughs> so that's pretty straightforward, but where a lot of the excitement in ecology comes is thinking about these types of indirect effects, things that are more subtle uh, and maybe more challenging to document, too, but possibly very important. Um, and so... I think that that's interesting that those are the kinds of effects we're interested in. We talk about them in ecology all the time in our textbooks, but we often don't analyze our data in a way that actually evaluates them intentionally. And so, for example, if we used a regression analysis and we had data on a primary consumer, a resource uh, like paraphyton biomass, uh, a secondary consumer, and a tertiary consumer, and we analyzed it with a statistical model that looks like this, which would be commonplace in the literature. We're actually asking a cause, we're, we're testing a hypothesis of causal relationships that say that each of these things uh, uh, have a causal impact on the primary consumers. But in fact, but in fact, our, uh, so this, this ignores these indirect effects uh, that where, where we might expect that, the, that, in fact, the way we set this up, if it was really just a food chain, we're not really, we don't really think that the tertiary consumer uh, is actually eating the primary consumer. Now it might, but the way this hypothesis is set up, we're not thinking that. Yet we analyze the data and look as, as though that's the way the effect does. And so the, the proper way to characterize this causal pattern that, that our biology is telling us about would look like this, where you have a primary consumer, it's affecting the secondary consumer, it's affecting the third consumer, the resources, it's also it's eating, and then you have an indirect effect. So how do you model that? Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so uh, so how do you model that? That's where I'm going to go to the next slide. And I had this one little point. So let's see. This only about, So this kind of model really also only lets you look at one trouble level. So there you go. So there's two points I want to make about this. This kind of an analysis, number one, does not test for the indirect effect, uh, at, least not, uh, at least not in the way that it's intended to be played out. Secondly, if you do an analysis like this, you, you have an entire, here is a trophic web hypothesis, but you can only evaluate the effect on one variable at a time, on one uh, consumer, for example, at a time. But in fact, our hypothesis is a web hypothesis. So what we, we have an important hypothesis that is really often not evaluated is does the overall model, the, the model with direct and indirect effects, does that actually uh, uh, ma match the data that we obtain? Uh, and so, uh, before I tell you about how I'm going to try to take that on, uh, our work is done in the Everglades. I'm sure you guys have no idea where that is. Um, and so I'll just skip off to, uh, 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 so what I want to tell you about are data from a sampling study that uh, Evelyn Geyser and I, and in, uh, in its origins, Tom Philippi, uh, have been involved with for, um, uh, eight, we're in the eighth year right now. Uh, and it is a study that is intended to document landscape scale patterns of, uh, of food webs in the Everglades and, and with the intent to be to evaluate how restoration activities and management activities may actually uh, influence and possibly hopefully benefit these, uh, um, uh, the biota. Um, I, I wanted to mention that on the first slide I also had uh, uh, my lab manager, my front lab manager, Allison Scheidler mentioned. And Franco uh, Tobias, who works at, with uh, and I think is a lab manager for Evelyn's lab, uh, and those two guys have been very important in in, in this study. Uh, Franco, working with, uh, has worked with this project through its entirety, 
And uh, I'll talk about some hair fighting data, and he's been very instrumental in, in obtaining those data. And then Allison has been working with me for about two years now, but she's very talented with the uh, with statistical analysis and with computer programming. And so she has uh, kind of allowed me to realize the dream of the analysis, and I'll show you that today. Okay, so uh, we sample about 155 sites uh, every year in uh, between actually the last week of September and the first week of December. And we picked that because we have a lot of historical information to tell us that that is the period when the aquatic, the freshwater Everglades is changing the least. And so you've got the high water, you have, um, you're at the end of the growing season, but the first cold front generally comes through in about now, except maybe not this year, uh, or into early December. And when the first cold front gets through here and, why, and temperatures drop down into the 40s, the parafighting mats definitely die back. And the dynamics in, in the aquatic ecology that we're interested in certainly starts to change. Uh, and, and of course, you never know from when you're the next, when exactly <coughs> that is going to happen. Uh, and so we just picked this window to try to be able to sample this many sites. It takes two and a half months to visit that many sites and get the data we're going to get, even by going by helicopter. So we, we wanted to have a window that was long enough that if we randomized the, the visitation within space, that we could basically treat the data as one data set uh, within a year. And, then, and that's what I'm going to do. There you go. So right now I'm going to talk about data from 2005 through 2010. Uh, and uh, we actually have the 2011 data, and I just haven't got around to uh, – actually, Allison has done a lot of the analyses, uh, and I just haven't got a chance to put it into this talk. Um, and the way we get our data is we sample with a one meter square throw trap, and then Evelyn's lab, uh, uh, Evelyn and my lab, we send one person along, and they take their parafighting you know, core parafighting data from inside those those throw traps. And so uh, we do three replicates for every one of those 155 sites. We get information on parafighting biomass, tissue, phosphorus, and 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 parafighting species composition. We also get information on the density of fish in this less than eight centimeter kind of size class and macroinvertebrates that are large enough to be caught on a two millimeter sieve. You know, these are example of species, the sort of typical things. Um, the, the information that we uh, um, obtain, uh, or the independent variables that we get, are going to be are related to hydrology, like the depth of the time we sample and how long has it been since that site last dried, we get that from Eden. We get uh, biomass and the percent of the parafighting mass, our biomass of parafighting, and the percent of the map is comprised of species that we think of as, you know, classically thought of as more edible. Uh, greens, non-filamentous green algae, and diatoms, and uh, blue-green algae being the other major component of that. Uh, and we get information on small fish, um, invertebrate biomass, uh, also density, but I'm going to talk about biomass today. Uh, and, and we, we uh, uh, yeah, we can characterize on a meter square basis the biomass. Um, and then in this study, I'm making a distinction between small fish, those that are less than 15 millimeters, and crayfish that are below 10 millimeters. And what I'm calling large fish in this study, which is going to be greater than 15 millimeters, uh, or, uh, but, but they're going to be less than 8, mil eight millimeters. So it's, not, it's still not what in other things in my lab we think of as, as large, large fish. Uh, and I can talk about the role of those fish in this kind of analysis and what we try to do about that, about them. Uh, if you like, uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but this cutoff is based on the gate limitation analysis and those earlier experimental studies that I told you about. Uh, and so basically, we can characterize the biomass of, uh, of fish in, in, into trophic groups. So we have uh, carnivore, carnivorous fish and invertebrates, omnivorous fish and invertebrates, and then, and then herbivores. Uh, over the course of this study, um, the, the years have varied quite a bit, and so this is a plot that is the proportion of sites that dried within the, path, the previous 365 days from when we visited, from 2005 through 2010. And so you can see that they vary from uh, a dry year in 2009 when 81% of the sites dried to a very wet year in 2010 when 38, only 38% 38 of the site dries. Here's a map that kind of illustrates the geography of these sites. So there's all of our study points, and in blue are the sites that had not dried in the previous 365 days for this talk, we'll call those long hydroperiod, 
and the red had dried. So you can see that in the very dry year, just this core area, primarily 3A, uh, held water in 2009. In 2010, most of the, much of the, the landscape had been inundated for the previous year. So how are we going to deal with this problem of, uh, of, of analysis of data when I, my hypothesis is a network rather than a, a, direct, a single causal framework? Uh, our approach is going to be to use a structural equation model, uh, which is an analysis that allows you to, import, to basically have uh, um, variables within the model function as both dependent variable and independent variable. So for, for tests for fitting certain aspects of the model, the, uh, a particular variable kind of in the middle of your framework can be a dependent variable, but then other parts of the model it functions as an independent variable. Uh, and so uh, the way we approach this is the first thing you have to do is construct a model. And so here is a food web model uh, that we have uh, for the Everglades. And on one hand, and for people in this room that know a lot about it, this is a gross oversimplification of the Everglades. On the other hand, look at all of these arrows of possible effects. And I, uh, I actually I gave this talk at uh, Virginia Tech uh, a couple of weeks ago, and a former postdoc of mine who knows something about structural equation model, he saw this and he laughed out loud when he saw this because look how many uh, uh, parameters we're going to have to estimate. Um, when you want to think about fitting one of these models, you take the number of boxes and the number of arrows and you add that up. And you, you know, ideally, you'd like to have at least four or maybe even as many as five times the, uh, the number of boxes and arrows sum for the number of observations. In this case, we have 155. And so in fact, this model, there's basically about four observations per, per uh, uh, parameter we're estimating. So it's actually not so bad. And, and uh, as ecology papers go, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, now, that has forced us to do things like, you know, we, we pooled a lot of different species for this particular analysis into carnivores, omnivores, and herbivores. We also have all these small fish and invertebrates. We pull basically everything that's small enough to go in the mouths of these two guys. Um, we have paraphyton biomass and, and paraphyton edibility. And then we have two parameters for hydrology and two parameters for uh, uh, the phosphorus, the tissue phosphorus and paraphyton uh, that allows us to model a nonlinear relationship. Because we have, you know, one of the keys is number one, I showed you some of the background for experimental studies to justify hypotheses and justify this re much reduced framework. I mean, we didn't just boil this down and take the minimum set of parameters we could because they were the only ones we had. We actually had done really about 15 years of work up to this point to identify these parameters as likely ones, uh, I would like to say. And along with that, we know the shapes of the responses of some of these other potential uh, biotic parameters to the uh, physical environment. A case in point is that as you add phosphorus, you're going to get a response in the paraffin, but it tends to be asymptotic. Uh, and so that's we wanted to account for that to get better model. And in fact, we found that uh, I, actually we have tried at times. We originally were fitting this Dacen's dry down and Dacen's dry down squared because we also know that that's often an asymptotic effect on, on the fish. Uh, and depth often drops out. But in case in this case, for this particular data set, uh, um, we didn't see that nonlinearity, so we went with this, these variables. Um, so the first thing you have to do is construct a model, and then you can actually test hypotheses. So you can also evaluate the fit of the data to the overall hypothesis. Then you can evaluate, test hypotheses about specific effects by removing pathways that are of special interest. And I'll, I'll illustrate that in a second. Um, and then you basically evaluate the fit of the model to the data, um, and you can compare model relative model fit by using things like uh, uh, Archimedes information criteria. And we did this using a program called Inquest. So, for example, uh, I kind of emphasized in this talk that I'm in, I want to ask if size structured interactions need to be included when I analyze my field data. And I've shown you some experimental evidence that suggests that they could be important in the Everglades. Um, but does that really scale up? The fact that mosquito fish will eat juvenile fish of their own species and others, does that really matter when you're talking about a 60 mile by 20 mile ecosystem and you're scaling up at that scale? So, um, so we can ask the, the effects of this kind of uh, uh, size structured interaction 
by including and excluding these pathways between omnivores and carnivores on small fish and invertebrates and compare model fit and ask if, in fact, uh, incorporating those parameters increases model fit. Another question, in, in community ecology, there's a lot of interest in the important in omnivory. Uh, does, does treating animals as omnivores rather than as uh, feeding at a particular trophic level, which is the more traditional way to treat them, does that, again, improve uh, model fit? Does it give a better description of this uh, uh, food web than, uh, um, than excluding it? So there's another uh, hypothesis that we can evaluate. So when we do that, uh, first, we find that we get, uh, that in fact our best model fit was that full model, our best model. So the, the full model describes the data well, uh, and there's no lack of fit and all of those kinds of things that you like to see. Um, now, here is a path, here is a, a summary of a hypothesis test where we dropped the path for size structured interactions and for omnivory. Now, one thing that's kind of neat about this is that we have six different uh, data sets, and so we can test each hypothesis six times. Uh, and um, uh, I, I will actually, I have, I can tell you for empirical reasons why I think it's, it's actually appropriate, in fact, uh, it's exactly right, to treat these as independent years. Uh, and I'm doing a bunch of time series analysis right now for more temporally uh, uh, detailed data, and we've done a lot of work on temporal autocorrelation and that sort of thing. And I can tell you about that if you're interested. Uh, but we're doing these right now. The other thing is that structural equation modeling incorporating a time series is a big problem. Uh, there are people who are sort of, it's one of these things that mathematicians are working on. Uh, and the M plus will actually claim to let you do this. But really, the reason you would want to do that is if you thought there were these temporal, uh, that, that you wouldn't treat these as independent. And I have, uh, in, I have separate data to argue that I don't think that's really the way to go or necessary. I don't think I'll prove it. Um, and actually, I think there's a lot to be said by repeating this test as if it were independent trials. So, what we find is when we drop size structured interactions, these are the, the AIC values are all up in the over 200. So that says that you lose a lot of information if you drop that if you drop that path and suggest that incorporating that path improves our description of the of the Everglades food web. In fact, quite a bit. Omnivory, in every case, the value of the lowest is five, uh, and it tends to be over 10. And as a rule of thumb, that suggests that it does improve the model. There's information that's added to our story about the Everglades by incorporating omnivory in the model, but clearly it adds much less than the size structure interaction. Okay, but you can do more. <laughs> I will get you not one sham wow, but two. You can do that now. Uh, you can do more than just the, the hypothesis test and evaluating the over model, overall model fit with the structural equation model if you're fortunate enough to have a, a enough replication to, to really fit the models well like we do. Uh, and so this is back to our, our full model. And uh, oops. And so what I'm referring to is that I, you can actually evaluate direct and indirect effects of uh, driver variables on some response variable. So for specifically, I might like to know uh, which is more important in affecting the abundance of carnivores in my food web. Is it the direct effect that if I dry out the place, I kill them and they have to recolonize from some kind of refuge, which is, I've always, I've, many people have heard me talk about this for years, and that is obviously a strong driver variable. Killing the animals <laughs> and then waiting for their population to regrow is pretty, not very controversial to call a strong driver variable versus some other effect like, like size structured interactions, which might be fascinating, and I'd love to study things like that, but it's a more subtle effect, perhaps. Um, so it, which is more important in determining their abundance in these data sets? The hydrology parameters that have a direct effect on them or a food web effect, whereby hydrology parameters affect periphyton, that affects small fish, and omnivores that affect carnivores, a, a multi-step or indirect effect. And so this analysis lets me partition the relative contribution of these two kinds of effects in a way that you can't do otherwise. So uh, I just reduced all the boxes now to just the boxes affecting carnivores. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on carnivore abundance. We can obviously do this kind of exercise for most anything in this model. So carnivore abundance, these are the direct effects on carnivore model, uh, abundance in our, in our model from our hypotheses. 
first the, the hydrology parameters and the availability of their food. Uh, and in fact, we can plot, these are standardized effect sizes, so these are, there's zero effect, negative or positive, and these are in standard deviation units. So in 2005, uh, changing uh, small fish abundance by one standard deviation of their variance increased uh, the carnivore abundance by one standard deviation. That's the interpretation of that. And in fact, the star says it's significant, so in fact, uh, the effect of food, small fish abundance, was consistent, that's surprisingly consistent, I gotta say. Uh, I didn't make this up. Across all of these years and all these data, uh, it was consistent and significant. If you look at the direct effect of hydrology, which is like my last 18 years of presentations, in fact, the direct effect is basically only significant in 2005, and it's by way of depth, which is not my usual parameter, and for the most part, it's not significant. Go! <laughs> uh, um, we can also in, uh, evaluate indirect effects of hydrology on carnivore biomass. So there's a, there's a direct effect of, of depth, but the indirect effects would be that depth would affect paraphyte biomass and, and, and paraphyte composition, which might affect availability of food for the smaller guys. It affects availability of food for the carnivores. And you can see that the indirect effects, uh, now this is adding across these, so, so there's, there's three, three different routes, right? So we're adding the different routes together their overall effect is actually about the same size as um, uh, the overall effect. And you can see that it's significant for each year 2005 through 2008. Uh, and there's that significant direct effect of, of depth, a uh, negative effect that then goes away. Okay, so, the, so there's an important indirect effect uh, that, ex that by way of food, so hydrology does affect carnivores, but by way of its effect on food web, at least in these data, at least that's the most parsimonious. Is model. that an extreme case? That 2005 was it like a really dry year. Not really. Mm -hmm. 2005 was it? Well, I tell you what. Uh, I don't want to go over too long, yeah. and we can go back and look at that okay. kind of stuff. Um, so uh, here is the effect of the other hydrological parameter, Dayson's dry down. There's its direct effect, and there are its indirect paths. And you can see that it Dayson's dry down has a significant indirect effect in 2008-2009. So the indirect effects of hydrology, as measured by one or the other of these parameters, um, is significant and about uh, a tenth of the standard deviation uh, um, on carnivores uh, in, in, in five of the six years of the study. Um, now, carnivores do not, are not affected by nutrient addition by passive uptake across their gills. <laughs> or any other way. So adding phosphorus into the Everglades may give you more fish, but it is not because they're somehow becoming uh, plants. Uh, and in so, in fact, there are no hypothesized direct effects of nutrients on carnivorous fish, but there are effects by way of this, these indirect effects. And so here we tested those through two different routes. One is through the paraphyte biomass, and the other is through the <coughs> community composition. And the first two years, these are not significant, and I'm still scratching my head about that, but you see that there's a higher effect size in the first two years of the edible paraphyte route uh, than in the rest of the years. Um, these effect sizes, do, these effects do vary through time. Now, these are not uh, significant unto themselves, but I think it's, it's, but you can see that the effect size goes up and down, so it's high in the first, the, the first and third year, and it's lower in uh, some of the other years. So the effect sizes do vary through time. And what I'm really interested in is trying to bring this together across the years. And so now, here I have six estimates of the effect, in this case, the effect of edible paraphyton on omnivores. Um, um, and I, so I have those effects by, by, you know, there's either a direct route as food and an indirect route through the small consumers, and you add that together, or actually you multiply it, but you get the, you get the, um, the cumulative indirect effect, and you can see that actually across years, there's an inverse relationship between the, the, how, the hydro period for the year and the strength of the effect. It's strongest in years that are relatively wet, and it's weaker in dry years. Now, the 2011 was a very dry year, and so it's going to give us a point on out over here on the right. So I'm really anxious to add that and see, you know, if it comes in up here and goes out of way, well, that's <laughs> science, right? So we've got, I think I've given this talk in a couple places, so I blame my 
stuck my hypothesis out there, so to speak. Uh, and then here's another one, the effect of small fish and invertebrates on carnivores, and there's no relationship between hydrology. That was the one that was significant every year. Um, the place I want to go with this, and this is why it's waiting for me to do the analysis, because Allison gave me all the files a while ago. This is my fault, not done. But I want to analyze the structure, the community structure, the relative abundance of species within these trophic classes that we created to see which species are responsible for these effects. Okay, so um, experimental analysis community structure is very powerful. Uh, and it's absolutely the way to go, and it's particularly good for students who are working on a, to finish a degree in, in real time. Uh, however, it's inevitably going to be limited in terms of your spatial ap application and the temporal extent of that kind of work. And so, if you can combine experimental studies with spatially and temporally broad sampling data, uh, all the better. And structural equation modeling provides a powerful analytical tool to uh, evaluate these kinds of data both evaluate hypotheses and especially to partition direct and indirect effects and get estimates of those. Um, interaction models that included omnivory and size structured uh, interactions gave the best fit to our data from the Everglades. Kind of getting here to more specific results. Uh, omnivory was less important than size structured interactions. Not what I would have expected. Uh, landscape scale hydrology affects interannual variation in trophic interactions uh, and uh, and in fact, some of our experimental results that I tested specifically, the effects of these size structure interactions, they do seem to scale up because I saw their effects uh, actually as ubiquitous in the field data as I would have predicted based on my mesocosm type studies. So for future work, we want to take these results uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the, the fact that they support the inclusion of certain kinds of trophic interaction top-down effects and use these in simulation model that we're doing, modeling that we're doing, that can be used for evaluation exercises and other kinds of activities related to planning uh, Everglades restoration. Um, and uh, to conclude, we've been funded by, by some really nice folks in uh, the Everglades, the, the, the FCE always supports us. Uh, and I specifically want to mention Jan and Newman, who isn't with us anymore, and Andy Gottlieb, uh, who helped us as sort of managing this project over a number of years, and we, we miss their, uh, uh, their role. Thank you. Okay. Depending on when you want to have a faculty meeting, we can talk about biology as long as you want. Yeah. All right, so as a hydrologist, I'm just trying to break down the key points from this talk, right? So the one point I got early on in the talk was that big fish eat little fish. <laughs> and I guess the second point I took away was that water depth is important for paraphyton and not so much for fish. In these data, in these data, um, this is, so in these data, that